Cameras keep getting better, and especially the ones that used to be the lousiest, like the ones on our phones. But how much of this is down to better sensors? I've been trying to decide on a new camera for myself, and it's pretty easy to get lost in the specs. Some people will argue for different brands, some people will insist that only the lenses matter, and I guarantee you someone here will comment that only the light and the scene matters, and it's not about the gear, and that person is insufferable. So on my quest for a new camera, I set out to learn how sensors really work, how they've changed, and where they're going. Welcome to Upscaled, our explainer show, where we break down the tech that makes your photos better. Cameras do keep getting better, but it can feel like the pace of improvement has really slowed. You can go look at photo galleries of the original 5D, released in 2005, and they still look pretty darn good. Heck, in some performance tests, sensors seem to have barely improved in the past decade. Obviously, resolution has kept going up, but otherwise, most of the improvements in sensors has been about reducing noise and improving dynamic range, which is nearly the same thing, and building sensors that can be read more quickly. First up, some basics. A sensor is essentially a grid of photodiodes. Now, we talked about diodes way back in a previous episode, but essentially they are like a one-way valve for electrons. By itself, silicon doesn't really let electrons move around too easily, but by mixing in some atoms of other elements, you can make a silicon crystal much more conductive. In a diode, electrons can flow from the N side of a diode, which is tweaked to have more free electrons, hence be more negative, to the P side, or the positive side, which has so-called holes, spots where a silicon atom can accept a free electron. Try to move electrons the other way, though, with so-called negative bias current, and electrons will fill in the holes on the P side and then bump up against the electrons on the N side and create a region where there is no space for electricity to flow. This is called a depletion region and is essentially a barrier at the margin between the two sides of the diode. You can combine this with another phenomenon called the photovoltaic effect, where photons hitting a surface have a tendency to knock some electrons free. In a solar cell, this generates the current that you can get power from. But in an image sensor, because of that negative bias current, any electrons knocked free by photons get trapped in that depletion region between the two sides of the diode. In a CMOS sensor, which is pretty much every camera these days, each pixel has some additional circuitry built into it aside from the photodiode. There is a readout transistor, which can measure the trapped electrical charge. There is a tiny amplifier that can boost the signal coming off of the photodiode. And there is a reset transistor, which can run power through the diode the correct way and essentially clear out the accumulated electrical charge. These on-pixel electronics make CMOS sensors speedy. They can read and reset quickly. But in the past, this could also be a big source of noise. Variation between the millions of tiny amplifiers and transistors would mean some pixels would just tend to read out a stronger or weaker signal, depending on their manufacture. And this would create so-called fixed pattern noise, a repeated pattern of fuzz you would see on each image. According to Lau Norgard, the VP of R&D at Ultra High End Camera Maker Phase 1, this isn't actually much of an issue anymore. Along with readout noise, which is the sort of background hiss of your camera, if you will, fixed pattern noise has been mostly corrected by better manufacturing processes and built-in noise reduction. Some cameras store an image of their own fixed pattern noise and use it for correction, and others can measure their own sort of background hum off of the sensor and use it to correct noise before the image is ever saved to memory. And controlling noise is crucial to a camera's low-light performance and dynamic range. This is the measure of how big a range of brightness the camera can actually record. It's the balance between when a pixel clips or gets overexposed and goes to pure white, all the way down to when the shadows are so dark they get lost in the noise floor. This is the point where if you were to brighten up the dark parts of an image, you wouldn't get any detail or color back, you would just be brightening up the background noise. Shadows so dark, there's no detail left. We talk about this in terms of signal to noise ratio, and it's akin to trying to make an audio recording in a noisy room. If you're trying to record yourself and your voice is quieter than the background noise, then if you try to make your recording louder, you will just end up boosting the background noise at the same rate as your voice. You can't separate the signal, the voice, from the background sound. It's lost in that noise floor. In a camera, this is like trying to boost the digital ISO 
so of an image when the scene is just too dark. Sure, you end up making the image brighter, but you end up making the noise brighter too. This can even be an issue on a bright sunny day. To keep from overexposing a very bright image, you might pick a very fast shutter speed and still end up with shadows so dark that if you try to recover them in editing, they just come out noisy. So if internal electronic noise is mostly controlled in cameras these days, what's causing all this image noise? Well, according to Norgard, unfortunately, it's physics. So-called shot noise is caused because light is made up of discrete photons. To explain it, Norgard used the off-repeated buckets metaphor. <laughs> But you know what? It's a great metaphor, so I'm gonna repeat it again. Imagine you wanted to figure out how much rain falls on different parts of your yard. And to test this, you set out a bunch of buckets, i.e. pixels. Now, ideally, you could test this by leaving all the buckets out during an entire rainstorm. But let's say you're in a really big rush, so instead you just set out all the buckets for one single second. Your signal, i.e. the amount of water you've collected, is going to be very small. And from that, it's very hard to say where the rain is actually heaviest and where you just happen to collect a few extra drops because the drops all kind of fall randomly. Sensors have the same problem. Light is emitted as discrete photons, but it's not emitted or reflected uniformly. And if you are only collecting for a very short amount of time, it can be difficult to reconstruct a clear image from that randomness hitting the sensor. So how do you fix this? Bigger buckets. That is to say that larger sensors and larger pixels in particular can help overcome the effect of this randomness. By capturing more photons for a given area and more photons overall, the random effect of this shot noise is diminished. Larger pixels help with dynamic range in another way as well. Pixel size is a major driver of so-called full well capacity, essentially how many photons and electrons a pixel can register before it fills up. At this point, the pixel usually clips, it goes to pure white and loses all detail. Now, the dream sensor would be one that could record every single photon that struck it, but never filled up. And people are working on this, including the Quanta Image Sensor at Dartmouth, but we are not there yet. But we can't just keep making image sensors bigger in the meantime. For one thing, a big slab of silicon is expensive and it leads to a chunky camera. Plus there are some other drawbacks we'll get to in a second. So how else do we improve image sensitivity? Well, one way is so-called backside illuminated or BSI sensors. On a typical CMOS chip, all that handy circuitry we've been talking about that improves readout speed actually takes up a fair amount of the chip surface area. As much as 25% or more of the sensor that can't actually be used for light collection. Now, a BSI chip essentially flips the sensor around and puts the electronics on the back, leaving the entire front of the chip available for collecting light. Now, this seems obvious, but the manufacturing challenges inherent in this are significant enough, including thinning down the chip, essentially grinding it thin enough for the wires to be able to reach through it, that BSI sensors were limited to tiny smartphone chips until pretty recently. Sony had the first full-frame BSI chip on the A7R2 in 2015, and Canon's very first BSI chip ever is expected on the upcoming flagship R3. So how else can we improve noise and dynamic range? Well, to return to our rain analogy, you could empty the buckets out and run that experiment multiple times. Or to put it in photography terms, you could just take multiple images and average them together. This smooths out the random nature of that shot noise and is actually the main way that smartphone photos have improved in recent years. The tiny sensors of phones make them especially susceptible to noise, but it also makes them exceptionally quick to read out an image. This lets you capture a half dozen photos or more in a fraction of a second. In fact, the iPhone's deep fusion mode and Google's HDR Plus both capture as many as 15 images that are combined together into the final photo you actually see. Even phase one is starting to do this, though their giant camera sensor takes a quarter of a second or more to read out, so bring your tripod. We're also starting to see this in video cameras. Canon C300 Mark III's dual gain output mode combines two images together into each image individual frame of a video. And this has actually long been the secret sauce of camera maker Ari, who is behind pretty much every high-end Hollywood movie you've seen in the last decade. In general, larger image sensors are slow, and this can cause problems with so-called rolling shutter. CMOS sensors expose the image line by line, and the bigger the sensor, the slower this tends to be, which can cause distortion 
in moving objects. Mechanical shutters can help this, but it's still a problem with video recording, and electronic shutters are the norm on phones and even popular on mirrorless cameras for silent shooting. For an example of just how bad this can get, check out our review of Fuji's GFX 100S. You can actually build a CMOS sensor with a so-called global shutter, which reads the entire sensor all at once, but the additional electronics can take up more than 50% of the sensor's surface area, diminishing dynamic range and light sensitivity. But here's where BSI sensors, and especially so-called stacked sensors, may help. In a stacked sensor, like the stacked CPUs we've been talking about, the chip is actually built of multiple layers, all attached together with silicon channels and copper contacts. This lets camera makers add way more processing power directly onto the sensor, including things like big on-sensor DRAM caches. This is how the Sony A1 manages 30 frames a second at 50 megapixels. All that data gets dumped into on-sensor RAM before it's written to the memory card. Even without a true global sensor that reads the entire frame all at once, stacked sensors make it fast enough that there's really no difference. Heck, there are even rumors that Nikon's upcoming Z9 will use a stacked sensor to shoot an astounding 160 photos a second, though there is no word on what resolution or format those might end up being. In reality, sensor performance is still improving. Cameras like the Sony A1 or Canon R5 may not have vastly improved noise performance or dynamic range compared to their predecessors, but the fact that they manage the same performance with many more smaller pixels is what's really impressive. Plus, the fact that these giant sensors can be read out dozens of times a second for high frame rate shooting would have been impossible just a few years ago. But what about the future? Could we see super advanced exotic material sensors in the coming years? Well, maybe, but not for a while. The reality is silicon generates current really well from visible light, which kind of makes it one of the best materials for the job. Plus, we're really good at making it. There are some exotic gallium arsenide-based sensors out there, but they only detect infrared, which is not terribly useful for your daily selfies. Graphene sensors also get floated a lot, but until we see graphene get used for really anything, it just doesn't feel terribly likely. Curved sensors are a possibility. There are some real advantages there with resolution and particularly edge sharpness, but they'd have to be paired with precisely manufactured lenses. No more using third-party lenses or mixing and matching with adapters which actually sounds like something that camera and lens makers would probably love, just another way to lock you into an ecosystem. In reality, most improvements in image quality will probably come from so-called computational photography. Faster sensors and more on-camera processing will make things like smartphone-style image stacking available on DSLRs by default, and AI-advanced image processing will allow for things like improved shadow detail and noise reduction built into the camera. For now, I will be hoping for the future where our never-clipping, unlimited dynamic range sensor arrives. But until then, I need to pick between the Sony A1 and the Canon R5, and I've rented both of them, and I still can't decide. Let me know what you think I should get in the comments below. There are pros and cons to both, or maybe I should just spend $40,000 and get a 150 megapixel camera from phase one. Sound off in the comments below, let me know what you think, and we will see you next time.